Hi, I'm Seema Anand and I'm back here today with Dr. Ali, who as you all know by now is a sexual health consultant that we work with. Ali, today, I'm sorry first of all for my voice because this has been, as you know, going on for about two months and I still haven't found my voice, which is really distressing me. But today I want to talk about a very important subject, which is the pain that women feel during sex. Unfortunately, this is something that's never been dealt with. Women are just expected to accept the pain that they feel during sex. It probably stems from the fact that women's pleasure wasn't considered important enough. So it was like, yeah, she's not getting any pleasure. She's just getting pain. It doesn't really matter. But as we know, it's a lot more than that. Uh, pain during sex can be from medical reasons. It can also be from things that impact the partner. So it's not as straightforward as just saying, oh yeah, you've got pain, it doesn't matter. So today, I'd like to go through some of the reasons that cause pain and how we can deal with it. I mean, as you say, having pain during sex is not okay. So it's really important that, that we address that. I'm thinking about that sort of term pain during sex. I mean, it can be pain on the outside. It can be pain with penetration or deep inside your abdomen. It can happen sort of during or after sex. And so there are lots of different ways of, of looking at this and lots of different causes. So I think that's a really good point. Let's actually call it pain during sexual activity. Okay. Now, I understand that there's a medical term for it. So dyspareunia. And what does dyspareunia mean? It means basically means pain during, usually during sex, but can be after sex. And it can be superficial. So that means like on the outside, uh, in the, the opening, or it can be deep inside. So that's deep. Excellent. So what I've done is just for ease of purpose, I have kind of broken this down. I know it's a huge subject, um, but mm -hmm. I've broken down into little tiny subheadings, a few things that cause women pain during sexual activity. So if we can take each of these things one at a time, mm -hmm. and it'd be great if you can tell us, for instance, um, where you would feel the pain if this was to happen to you, how long that pain might last, what kind of pain it might be, and what might be a potential solution, if any. Yeah. yeah. So I want to start with the very first thing, which is the discharges that women get, because I think this is something that most people have figured out, that if you're getting a an abnormal discharge, there is definitely something not right. And Many of these discharges do come from something that is going to cause either burning or pain or discomfort. Certainly could. So it's normal to have some discharge, but it shouldn't be offensive. So it shouldn't have a bad smell. It shouldn't be itchy or irritative. Probably the most common cause of a discharge that can give you itch and irritation and then pain during sex. So that could be pain on the outside because it feels all itchy and scratchy and up in the vagina is something called thrush or candida or yeah. some people say yeast infection. So it's not a sexually transmitted infection. You always, everyone has sort of candida in their vagina and it sort of goes out of balance. So then it takes over and it gives you a bit like having a cold in your nose. It's the same idea. You get this sort of itchy, irritative discharge and then that can be really sore, but it can also give you an itch at other times. And it happens and you'll know that you have those symptoms and it can be really quite sore and painful. The, the good news is that it's really simply treated. I mean, it, the, the, in answer to your question about what it feels like, it's like a sort of sore, sharp sort of scratchy itchy pain and it's usually accompanied by a quite a distinctive discharge so it's like white cottage cheese so thick white discharge and quite can be cl clumpy and would you feel this in the vagina all the way up the cervix where would you feel this pain so you'd have it on the outside because it can really irritate the vulva so that's all the skin on the outside and it can be really sore at the opening and inside the vagina so it irritates the, the sort of medical term for irritation is itis so like inflammation so it can give you a vaginitis so it inflames the vaginal walls so it can be really sore so it's in sort of it's difficult to locate where the pain is but it, you'll feel it on the outside and sort of just inside are there other things that are commonly known to cause discharges that we might need to know about well there are other common causes of, of discharge are sexually transmitted infections okay. and so quite a few of those things like chlamydia gonorrhea which are really common often don't have symptoms 
And they may have some discharge because they inflame your cervix, but they don't usually give you pain during sex unless you have a complication. Maybe we'll go on to later when it can ascend and give you tummy pains and other symptoms. But there is a vaginal infection called trichomonas vaginalis, which is also really common. Of course, it's called TV for short. And that can give you a vaginitis, like it can really irritate your vaginal walls and the outside. And it can get really, can be really quite sore. So that could impact and, and make it sore when you have sex as well. So the pain that you'd feel generally is like an itchy burning type of pain. It can be burning and, and sore and, and can be sharp as well at the, at the opening and inside the vaginal walls. Okay, so any kind of abnormal discharge, which means that if there is a bit of smell to it and if there is well, some it, kind of color. So interestingly, in terms of what discharge looks like, I mean, people try and sort of analyze their own discharge and sometimes that can be hard. It's not always classic like the textbook. So we've talked about what thrush looks like. That's that classic. Um, you can get imbalances in the normal bacteria and that does happen a lot, something called BV or bacterial vaginosis. And that's usually the thing that gives you that smelly, fishy discharge. But that doesn't generally doesn't give you an inflammation. And that shouldn't actually be sore, but it can give this quite offensive smell. And quite commonly, that's caused by washing too much or using feminine hygiene products that we really wouldn't advise at all. And then people can present with that discharge and then they think it's dirty, so they wash more and then the problem continues. It's quite hard to sort of analyse your own discharge, but it could be a change, it could be a different colour, it could change smell and it can be itchy and irritative. So I guess the takeaway from that is that if you suddenly find that it's different to the usual discharge, you should look into it. The second thing that I want to talk to you about now, I know that this is a huge subject, but it's the pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, yep. which I get a lot of women writing in saying that they feel pain all the way up inside their sexual organs, so around the cervix, sometimes sort of in the lower abdominal region. Yeah. And I was just wondering, is that, is that PID and what is PID? Yeah, so PID is pelvic inflammatory disease, and that is classed as a sexually transmitted infection. So it's caused commonly by sexual infections like chlamydia, gonorrhea, and some other infections that basically are infections that are in your sort of lower tract, so maybe like in the cervix, and then they ascend. So they go through the cervix, into the womb, and around the womb tubes and ovaries. So it's a complication of a sexual infection. And it's a diagnosis that we make clinically. So if someone comes in, they have symptoms. So classically, they have deep pain with sex. So they feel it in their lower abdomen. They feel it maybe on one side or the other or in the middle. And it can be really quite severe. It's a real continuum. Some people don't have many symptoms of it. And some people can be really so ill that they're actually in hospital with antibiotics through their vein and being admitted. It can be that bad. Oh, wow. And then there's other people who clearly must have had it and had an infection that ascended. And they only know when they go and have fertility tests because they can't get pregnant and they've got some damage to one of their tubes or um, and like a blockage or, a, or a, some scarring. And they've had no symptoms. So it is a real continuum PID. But commonly what we would see is someone comes in, they might have irregular bleeding. So bleeding at the wrong time, not when the periods. They can may have some discharge. They will have this pain with sex. They may have pain at other times in their lower abdomen. In answer to your question, what the pain can be like, it can be a sort of period crampy pain. It could be a sharp pain. It can be really quite severe. It'll stop them having sex, penetrative sex, because the pain is, is too much. But it is a it is a real continuum. And is this something that is likely to transmit back? I mean, if there's an infection, if you're having sex with somebody, can they then get that infection from you as well? Is that how it works? Yeah, so that's a good point. So the fact that we class it and it is a sexually transmitted infection, obviously you pick that infection up from sex. And we will give that woman antibiotics. And then partners have got to be treated. Otherwise, you're going to play ping pong. And the partner may, if they've got a male partner, they may or may not have symptoms. 70% of people with chlamydia have no symptoms. So they need testing and they need treating as a contact, regardless of their, their test results. So I guess if you are getting pain all the way up inside your cervix, so it feels like it's all the way at the back of your um, sexual organs. It sort of feels deep. What well, they describe is sort of deep in the abdomen. They, they'll come in and say, I've got pain in my abdomen, doctor, pain in my, in my lower tummy. And and it will be, and then they'll get a sort of cramping, often per se period-like during sex, and it'll, it'll, they'll feel it in their abdomen. Okay, perfect. So if that's what you're feeling, 
you at least have a vague idea of what it could be. Because didn't you also tell me a while ago that there isn't any regular test for this? It's something only that is tested for um, if somebody goes in with this complaint and they've ruled other things out. Well, PID is something that we've diagnosed by taking a history and examining and doing the tests. There's not an actual sort of one-off test that we can just sort of look with a camera or just do a PID test. It's a sort of, it's it's a diagnosis that we make looking, we look under the microscope, see if there's lots of inflammation in the cervix. We take the same take care, careful history and examination. Um, sometimes actually the tests that we take for sexual infections that we've taken from inside the vagina can be negative. And actually that can complicate the, the sort of understanding of it because the infection's gone higher up. And you're not swabbing from around the womb tubes and ovaries, you're swabbing in the vagina. So that's something we have to carefully explain to patients. Even if their tests come back negative, they could have had an infection that's gone up and caused this problem. And what we want to do is really make sure that if there is any question they might have PID, that it gets treated. Because what we don't want is a complication of PID. So we take it seriously, because it can affect, like we just discussed, um, your tubes and, the, and your fertility. Sometimes people can get abscesses or other problems higher up if you leave an infection untreated. Right? I think with everything that Dr. Ali says, um, it makes you realize just how important it is that when women say they have pain during sex, just how important it is to actually look into it rather than saying, oh, this just happens. And for women, particularly, if you are getting pain during sex, it's not your partner's job to figure out what's going on with you, your body, you do it first. Yeah, it's really important people come to see us. I mean, sometimes people come with pain and it's related they're pregnant and there's a problem with a pregnancy or a pregnancy in the wrong place, like an ectopic. You know, we've got to keep an open mind with a woman who's in that period, that a fertile sort of part of her life. Okay, the next thing, which is quite a common one, but we'd still like to go over it, is vaginal dryness. Um, what are the different kind of sensations that you can get pain-wise? And where would you feel the pain? Is it just very obviously in the vaginal canal or can it be elsewhere as well? We see this a lot. Okay, and it's that what we're, we're sort of talking about here is sort of poor arousal. So normally when a woman will get aroused, they'll produce their own lubrication. And it will also, arousal has different sort of effects on your body as well. So increases blood flow. So as well as getting the lubrication, you get changes in the vaginal walls. Your cervix moves up and away. So it really does, it is quite different, your anatomy, during that process of arousal. So if you're having genital touching or you're having penetration when you're not aroused and it feels dry, then that can be a real problem. It can be really uncomfortable. So you're probably going to feel that most of that pain at the opening. It may be difficult at the opening. And if it's painful, your muscles are going to tense up as a reflex. It's sort of normal, isn't it? If you touch that table, it's hot, you're, you're going to pull away. So sometimes that will happen if it's, if it's dry and sore and it can feel scratchy. Um, sometimes people can get little tears or breaks in the skin because it's, it's, it's dry. So it's really important that when I see patients in the clinic and they're saying they're getting pain during sex, I, we ask about arousal and we ask about whether they're, you know, where exactly they're getting the pain and what that pain is like and we see it quite commonly with people who are in the perimenopause or postmenopausal because then their estrogen goes down and if your estrogen goes down as it does as you get you know in that time for go on for many years before your periods actually stop and then beyond it's called the gsm so what happens is the skin of the outside and in the vagina it gets a little bit thinner and it's not as elastic so it's really easily treated topical estrogen cream is is really really effective and it's very safe and you can use that for as long as you need. And it's really effective and it will reverse those changes in the skin. And that can be really important for just how your genitals feel, obviously for penetrative sex or any kind of touching on the outside. Um, and also it can help with bladder symptoms that sometimes people have around that time. It can be really helpful as well. So it's really important that people know about it. And the other thing that's really important when we think about topical estrogens is that somebody might be on HRT, you know, a patch or tablets or, or gel, and they're getting estrogen and they're getting progesterone from that way. But in addition, a high proportion of women also need topical estrogens on their genitals in addition to that. And I think lots of people don't realize that because that for some reason it's just not enough and it's not having the local effect. So there's nothing wrong with adding in and it's really safe, the topical estrogens. So my advice is if it feels, you know, you're in that perimenopausal time, you know, 45 and onwards, 
um, speak to your doctor and don't suffer. And I guess it's important to also to say that if you are feeling pain because the vagina is dry, lube is something that you should be using anyway. Absolutely. We recommend that. I'm sure you do. But, you know, use it at all times, regardless of your arousal. We think that's really, really important. Yeah. Don't actually wait till you feel, oh, am I aroused enough? Am I not aroused enough? Use the lube anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Not that, oh, stop, I'm dry. Let's get the lube out. Use it more like a sex tool. Um, and then we also take a history and wonder the other things that might be causing dryness. So we know that certain medications, so uh, for example, some antidepressants, really common people take particularly SSRI, so a type of antidepressant, and that can cause problems with desire, but also arousal and ability to reach orgasm. Some medications like antihistamines, for example, can have an effect. So we do really think about that. Even decongestants, apparently. Yeah. I mean, there is, yeah, there's, there's, there's evidence that quite a few medications can affect people's arousal response. The other problem is, of course, as soon as your brain gets involved and worries about not getting aroused or you're getting pain, Pain is like a switch. You can be nicely aroused and then you get pain or you worry about pain and it can switch off your arousal. So, you know, we have to start having a little look at what's going on there in a bit more detail. So basically have lube at the handy at all times. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the simplest ways of getting rid of pain. Again, the next one, common but underdiagnosed, like you've always said, endometriosis. So how long have we got? I mean, in a <laughs> nutshell, endometriosis is when you get bits of the lining of your womb in the wrong place. So it can sit sort of outside the womb, around the tubes or the ovaries in your pelvis. So what happens is when you have a period, it's really painful because you can get it bleeding and irritation in other bits of your pelvis. So classically people present with painful periods. They can present with lower abdominal pain at other times. They can get um, pain with sex, so deep inside, but like the PID pain, no, people aren't gonna know what's causing that pain. They're gonna know they've got pain deep inside when they when they have penetrative vaginal sex. And, and so that's how might people might present um, and it's really important that then that gets looked at and it gets investigated so there are patients that would need to go and see we would recommend gynecology go and get investigation get some treatment because it's not okay to have that pain and um, they need to they need to go and get a proper diagnosis and then get effective management is there anything that can actually tell a person that that may be what's causing it like, is there any way of understanding or knowing from certain things that you're going through or the type of pain that you're feeling that it could be endometriosis? I think the short answer to that is no, in that if you, if you have X symptom, it's definitely endometriosis. It doesn't really work like that. But it's yeah. that sort of pattern of symptoms. You know, if you're presenting with a, a long history of uh, painful periods, you've got pain during sex, you may be getting some other lower abdominal pain or, or maybe not at other times. Um, depending on when there's like adhesions, bits sticking to each other. There's lots of, of symptoms you can get. Um, sometimes people present later on, you know, with problems with fertility, for example, and then develop, they, they then get their diagnosis. Um, but there's not really a, a, a one symptom, but they okay. will be getting sort of crampy or sharp or any kind of lower abdominal pain in those circumstances. Okay, but I think, a... it's, I think it's hard to self-diagnose. So in answer your question, no. Um, so this is the pain that you feel all the way inside as opposed to on the vulva. This is sort of deep yeah, inside. This pain. is deep inside and you'll feel it and you'll feel it basically if you're pressing like in your sort of lower tummy. Okay. The next thing that I want to talk about very, very briefly is vaginismus. And I said very briefly because this is something that people have suddenly become aware of. And I know that a lot of people are um, either seeking treatment or looking to seek treatment for it. And it's a huge subject again. So maybe you could just mention a couple of lines on this and then we'll do a whole separate podcast on vaginismus. So we see this a lot. It's really, really common. It can affect women of any age, of any sort of background, ethnicity, different cultures. So that's the first thing to say. It's really, really common because a lot of patients come in and think they're the only one and, and they really aren't. It's basically made of a triad of things. So three things. The first thing is that people get pain. And it is a real pain that people are feeling. It's, you know, it's, it's, people sort of say it's in the head. They're getting pain. And they're getting pain because they're trying to stick something into a tense muscle. So if you tense your muscle and stick something into it, it's painful. Okay. It's associated with fear. And that can be as bad as a sort of phobia or anywhere on a continuum. But obviously your brain goes, it's going to be painful. And then it's going to have fear. And then it's all, what you also get is these muscles tense. And again, it's like a reflex. They could be sort of sitting there a bit tense. 
or they can tense up when something comes towards, you know, you're trying to put a tampon in or any anything into the vagina, any kind of penetration. And that often commonly happens what we call lifelong. It's always happened. You've never been able to get things in the vagina. Or it can sometimes happen what we call acquired. So you're absolutely fine. You have no problems. And then something happens and we look at what that is that then gives you that response. So you're getting the fear, you're getting the pain, you're getting the muscle tensing. And we work with that, but we work with that and make sure it's a, it's called a diagnosis of exclusion. So we want to rule out other causes of the pain. So at some point we will examine patients when people feel ready, that's ideal, but we'll do work with them and, and, and our psychologists or sex therapists will work with people to help them learn control of those muscles and to deal with the sort of cycle, okay. uh, sort of vicious cycle that people have got into um, of of these symptoms all sort of making making it worse but it's a, it's a really distressing condition and lots of patients they may just present for the first time when they're trying to get pregnant or want to get pregnant and then they come and they have a, a diagnosis of vaginismus made so it's it's a very real condition and it can be really really distressing wonderful thank you as i said we will be doing a whole separate podcast on vaginismus to give you more information on that but this is just to get you started on the fact that a lot of people, like you said, um, are told, oh, no, it's just it's psychological. It's in your head. Don't think too much about it. It isn't. It may come from the brain, but it, you feel it in the body. It's a very physical thing. So people get told, just relax. And I mean, it's well-meaning. But to be honest, if you could just relax, then, then my clinics would be empty. How true. OK, next one, vulvodynia. It basically describes a pain syndrome. So it's, it's, a, it's a cause of pain. Vulvodynia means anywhere on the vulva. And the vulva is just all of your external genitals, okay? Or it can just be around the opening. But basically, we rule out other causes of pain, other skin conditions, other, you know, maybe vaginismus, other things that might be causing that pain. And for some reason, people are getting pain messages. Again, it's a very real condition. People get pain. Um, and it's a very real condition that they get pain from a non-painful stimuli. So the posh word for that, the medical word is allodynia. So you might examine, classically examine people with a cotton bud, and they feel that as a sharp stabbing or burning pain when it should feel like a cotton bud. So for some reason, a bit like on simple terms, the nerves are a bit jangly and they're sending pain messages when they shouldn't. And we don't 100% know, I mean, that's a whole podcast in itself about the causes of vulvodynia, what might be happening there, things that are risk factors or triggers, and we could go into that. But basically, in a nutshell, it's a diagnosis where we exclude other issues and we it's, it's a sort of chronic pain syndrome where basically the, the messaging's gone a bit wrong for pain. And so you very careful diagnosis, ruling out other things, and then treat it like you treat other pain conditions, try and basically dampen down that pain response. Okay. And this could be literally for anything. I mean, like there's no... There's no way of pinning it down to any one thing. No. If we knew the one cause that triggered it, that would be brilliant. There are things that it's associated with. Okay. But we don't know exactly why that, you know, sometimes it happens after people have recurrent infections, sometimes associations with the combined pill. There's, there's you know, we could, we could talk a long time about this, but there isn't one thing. It can sort of just happen. So people have no problems and then they develop this condition. And we don't, we don't know everything about it is the honest answer. Okay. But we do know, um, you know, things that it's not is important to rule out and then ways of managing it. So I guess what I need to take away from that, what everybody needs to take away from that is that this is something that you feel just on the outside. This is not felt inside. No, but it, it, having said that, if you're getting pain, when you're trying to put something inside the vagina, it can feel sort of inside to people, that opening, you know, but it's, it's, it's at the opening, but sometimes it can be difficult to be to exactly localize or it can okay. feel just inside. But yes, it's basically pain on the outside and at the, at the opening, the vestibule before we get to the hymen. And this is actually when it literally feels so painful to the touch or feels like it's burning, even if you just touch it with the simplest thing. It's classically a sort of sharp burning pain. Thank you. Okay, the next thing is, and I find this one really hard to pronounce, so correct me if, I, if I'm doing this wrong, interstitial cystitis. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? It is. It's often called painful bladder syndrome now, so that might be easier to say. Painful um, bladder syndrome. So Thank basically, you. again, it's a condition we don't know everything about, but it feels like you have a urine infection. So you can get that sort of bladder type pain, you know, that sort of burning, sort of uncomfortable pain at sort of just the front of your 
of your tummy in the pelvis, um, but you haven't got an infection. And you get, it can be a chronic condition where you get this pain and it can give you pain as well when you're having vaginal intercourse. So it is again, something we ask about symptoms. Are they getting any kind of bladder symptoms? Are they getting any urinary problems, you know, peeing problems. So that's also really important to, to factor in and go and see someone if you're getting those, those problems. So if during sex, you get a pain all the way inside, which is then followed up with um, burning during urinating, is that the symptom? You may that get you're burning. You may be getting frequency of urine. You may be getting pain when you pee, like in your in your lower abdomen. Again, it can be quite hard for people to know the cause, but what they should know is that it's not okay that they're getting pain and they're getting troublesome urinary, you know, pee symptoms that they shouldn't be having. So those two things, they've got those two things together that may fit, but they need to go and see someone to make that diagnosis. We talked about hymens. Yeah. I really want to talk about the hymen because by and large, people think that there's something very miraculous about the hymen. The first time you have sex, it's going to hurt so much. It's going to bleed. All sorts of things are going to happen. Can we talk about hymens? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So what should we say? Well, I mean, the hymen is a thin membrane with a hole in it that sits just at the opening of the vagina. And lots of things can stretch it or tear it. Often it will tear. You may get a tiny bit of blood when that tears, and then you get these little tags of hymen. Uh, sometimes it just stretches, never actually tears, so it can vary. But the, but the problem that we see rarely in terms of hymen and pain is that there can be something that's not quite sort of normal about the hymen. So it can be a bit thickened, you know, like one lip, so it's harder for it to stretch or tear. Or sometimes you get little bands in it. So instead of it just looking like a little sort of hole in the center, you've got an actual band in the middle of it. So it's affecting getting something inside. So it can be a practical barrier. That is rare, but it is. It is, it is certainly a thing. And I've seen many patients with that. And sometimes there can be other problems like in the vagina. So the vagina is just a blind ending tube about 10 centimeters long. And you can get little, what's called septum, like walls that shouldn't be there in the middle of there as well. So Again, that's what we're looking for. We're thinking of vaginismus as being a diagnosis of exclusion. We're just thinking, however down the list of possible causes it is, we need to have that thought. So people may, you know, just not basically can't have penetration. They don't know why. Then it's not something they you know, need to be examined to have a look. So basically what we're saying is that the hymen itself should not be causing you painful sex. So the hymen itself, I mean, the first, when it, it, when it so the hymen will start off being intact. And then at some point it won't be intact and it will tear and you'll get these little tags or it will stretch. And during that time, that can be a bit uncomfortable. Sometimes you can get a little bit of bleeding or with the, with the tearing. And then you will simply, if I was examining patients, see little simple tags of, of the hymen. And then there's nothing further that should be felt from a, you know, there should be nothing that's a problem then for the hymen going forward. That is not anything that will cause you pain. Excellent. Somebody wrote in to me about her getting a puffy vulva when she has sex. Have you heard of puffy vulvas? Is that a thing also? I mean, it's not a medical term, but what I'm hearing from that is that she's getting swelling. So she's noticing swelling on the outside of her genitals when she has any kind of sex. And again, it's that thing of like, what might be causing that? Well, it's skin like anywhere else. So you could have an allergy to something. Latex condoms, sometimes people are allergic to latex. So mm. change those condoms. Could be using a lube that's irritating. Could be using some sort of feminine hygiene product. Sometimes what we find is people change how they behave after sex. They do lots of washing or using products that they think can irritate the, the you know, the uh, um, irritate the, the skin really badly. Um, it may be that there's some other kind of allergy going on that we're not understanding. Or is it, there's a bit of trauma, or is it really dry and it's getting rubbed and sore and that's feeling like it's really swollen? Um, is there something else going on? When we've talked about some sexual infections, has she got uh, an ulcer there? You know, she got the cold sore virus, the herpes virus causing a little sore that's feeling really tender and, and the skin's getting swollen. I mean, there's lots of things that could be happening with the skin, but it was completely normal. And then she has sex and it feels swollen. Then we have to ask ourselves what's happening at that point. What could be causing that swelling? So it is something that can happen. And if you are getting that, you need to go and have it investigated. Do yeah. go and see a doctor about and it. And really good for us to see when you've got the symptom. So seeing as when three days later and it's all gone back to normal can be a bit harder to, to do yeah, that detective work. So yeah. ideally we say, come in when you've got the symptoms, we can have a look. 
Excellent. Okay, now one of the things that people complain about is that they get this deep pain during sex, but only in some positions. In some positions, even with the um, really sort of deep penetration, they don't have that problem at all. What can be causing that? Okay, so a number of things. So if you think about, firstly, you think about arousal. So if we think about uh, when you get nicely aroused, the cervix moves up and away. If they're having sort of penis and vagina sex and the penis is hitting the cervix, that can be quite uncomfortable for some women, not all, but that can be an unpleasant sensation. So if that's happening and your arousal is poor, you might find that in certain positions. Um, and then in other positions, it's fine because you're not having the, the penis hitting the cervix. So that's one thing. It may be, if you think about what's down there in your pelvis, you've got your womb tubes and ovaries, you've got your bowel and you've got your bladder. So is there something in one position that's being hit or, or being, you know, causing you pain? If you've got like a little adhesion or if you've got sort of fibroids, benign lumps in your womb that are being hit in one position, or is it a certain position because you've got, it gives you bladder pain, you know? So it's thinking about what, what position is it that gives you pain and why? but it may be as simple as an arousal issue so again I think you're just not going to know and I think I'd really urge people just to come and have that discussion you know has it always been lifelong has it just occurred what any other symptoms and and we can do that work and look at it and then examine as well because we can then examine and see if we're finding causes for that positional pain but we wouldn't just say to people oh don't worry about it and just do it in the position it works we, we need to know you know we need to try and help them with that and work out why I was actually just going to say that. So when people come and say, oh, I'm not getting pain in this position, but I do get pain in this, it's not just okay to say, oh, well, just stick to the thing that doesn't give you pain. And why are you even trying to worry your head about trying to do something else? It's important to investigate. Yeah, definitely. And I think that it's important to go back to what we started off by saying, mm -hmm. that if you are feeling pain during sexual activity, no matter what kind of pain it is. Don't just dismiss it. Don't just say, oh, well, it happens. Actually go and have it investigated because you never know what it is. And there's no reason for you to be feeling pain during sex. No, exactly. Starting from that point, pain during sex is not okay. So as Dr. Ali says, if you're having any kind of pain during sexual activity, please don't self-diagnose or dismiss it or pretend that it's okay if it's happening, it'll go away. Go and see somebody keep a record of what kind of pain it is where it's happening and when it happens so that you can actually talk about it to your doctor but do go see a doctor i hope that you found this podcast useful if you did please do comment like subscribe as always and if you have any other questions write in to me at info.seema.anand at gmail.com don't worry the um, email address will be in the caption below so that you can find it easily in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Be safe.